Good afternoon and welcome to this UCSD career event. I'm so glad that you could be with us this evening. I am Vicki Krantz and I lead the group at Extension that runs the business science technology programs. And so my role tonight is to be the moderator. Our speaker is Phil Blair, the president of Manpower. I think many of you probably know Phil already, but in case you don't, let me say that between he and his business partner, Mel Katz, they run the Manpower franchise in San Diego County. And so I think that um, at any given time, they are the fourth largest employer in San Diego. And 30, growing. 3,500 people in, placed in jobs currently, yes? Today, does, as we sit here. <laughs> does this man know things about hiring? Yes, and so that's why we asked him to join us, and so with your help, I have a set of questions, and if you have questions toward the end, let's see if we can't get some of this distilled wisdom out of him. He wrote a book last year called Job One, and so, Phil, tell us, what prompted you to write the book? Well, I've been thinking about doing it for a long time because the number one way to get a job in this economy, and really for the last many years, is networking. It's who you know that knows someone that knows someone. Well, if you're going to network with someone, how about somebody that does nothing but hire people all day long, right? I mean, that's what we hire 50 to 75 people a day. So we are a perfect person to, to network with. But the problem came when the recession hit in 8, 9, 10, 11. There were so many good friends and wonderful people that were struggling career-wise that I just couldn't possibly meet with everybody that I wanted to, Vicki. So with help, um, I dictated the book. This will surprise you, but as we get to know each other, I am not a sit at a computer and type person. I'm a talker and eye contact and I love dealing with people. So I dictated the book to a reporter and we wrote it together. But that was my way of getting the information out that was so important to thousands of people at once that I couldn't meet with personally. I, I think that so many people are interested in not only how to get a job, but their dream job. Do you have thoughts about that? Well, I do, and the exercise that I tell people to do is start with your ideal job. If there were no limitations, money, location, family, education, experience, no limitations at all, what would be your ideal job? Now, as you ponder that, the reason for that is people would sit down with people like me and I would say, how can I help you? And they're very nervous because they're meeting a stranger and they used a lot of chits to get in front of me. And so I'd say, how can I help you? They would say, I need a job. I go, well, okay, that was kind of obvious, but we'll start differently. What kind of work are you looking for? And the sad thing, Vicki, they would say, I don't know. Well, once you say that, where do I start? I mean, if you don't know, how can I possibly help anyone down that career path? So the exercise I came up with is starting with your ideal job, your dream job. And if you read my book, you'll see that mine is the host, the Today Show. Matt Lauer's job? Why not me, right? And I know if I call Katie Couric, she'll come running back because she knows I'm there. We'll make a great team and they'll, instead of being in second or third, they'll be back to number one. This is my vision, my fantasy, and that's what I'm living through. So what I tell people is do their ideal job. And then with friends, and I also encourage maybe a couple of bottles of wine to be involved, Go through why that is your ideal job. And some examples for me are it's in a big city. You're meeting interesting people all day. I like pressure. I perform better under pressure. My wife tells me I create pressure just to energize myself, which I can't disagree with. But all of these pieces of the, of the job, and we come out with 20, 25 aspects of that job. And then we stop and we say, what are other career paths that have those aspects? Obviously, HR comes out. We love dealing with people, like meeting new people all day, like helping people. Uh, money is on my list, so that's uh, of interest. So what comes out is motivational speaker, author, um, HR, entrepreneur, all these sort of things. And then those are the paths I know to follow. And what I tell people is write in pencil. 
because you don't own those three or four career paths. I want you to go out and do informational interviews. I want you to meet people that are in the HR world. If you think you're interested in a career in HR, meet Claudia, there's lots of other people here tonight that you can talk to and see what it's like in that career. You may fall in love with it or you may go screaming away from it. If you go screaming away, erase. But you know, when I was talking to Vicki, she mentioned something else, and that could be of interest to me. Because it's like HR, but it's really not interviewing and benefits and all that sort of thing, and legal issues. And so I write that one in. I tell people I have three career paths in the running at all time, because you're going to add and drop all the time. But you have a goal. So when you sit down with people like me, you say, Mr. Blair, here are the three career paths I'm really interested in, and I'd like your advice on the HR path, and I'd like your advice on the entrepreneur path, because you've done both of those. Tell me about that, and let me ask you some questions about those paths, because they may be right for me, or they may not. I've, I, I've found so many passages in your book interesting. One of them was that you say, we are all temps. <laughs> well, that's my temp. Uh, my temporary placement background, but the average job in America today is slightly over three years, right? I have temporary assignments that last that long. And all of you who are working now, that position you're currently in is only going to work if two things meld well. One, you enjoy the job, you're satisfied, you like your coworkers, you like your management, you like the ethics of the company, you like the industry, you like what you're being paid, you're going to stay there. When one of those changes, and the two most important are learning more things, it's exciting, I learn new things every day, or I'm not energized by my coworkers. Those are the two that people typically change job for. You're going to move on. And you should move on. We only go around once in this life, and I want everybody to be excited about the job and where they are and why they're there. And if they're not excited, do something about it. Likewise, the employer is going to say, you cost me money, Mr. or Miss Employee, and you've got to be bringing energy to my company. You've got to bring skill and expertise that I need at the moment. And as fast as technology is changing, customers demanding entirely different services very quickly, when you stop meeting the company's needs, they're going to shake your hand and say, I encourage you to find challenges outside of our company. So if you love the job, stay current, keep taking classes, get certificates, learn new software, be in the moment, because if you get stale, you will be asked to move on, or if the company gets stale, they will lose their good people. So that's why I want us all to be tense. I want us to be on our toes. I don't want anybody to sit back and go, oh, I got a permanent job. Because I chuck on go, permanent is three years and three months on average. The days of starting, my father starting at a company and retiring 35 years later with a gold watch, is gone. We're only as good as our last project, as our last service, as our last sales. And a company is only as good as long as it keeps you energized, excited, and anxious to go to work in the morning. When either of those doesn't match, we move on. To me, we're all temporaries. So we're all in charge of our own career, me incorporated, <laughs> yes. And so uh, the marketing part, I think, is the part that so many people have trouble with. And so the answer is networking. Find people, create a network. Do you have thoughts about how to create and manage a network? Well, I do. And, let, and let's start with that career manager. If you think it's your boss, think again. If it, you think it's the professor in your class, think again. If it's your wife or husband 
really think again. Yeah. <laughs> They'll send you down the wrong path. You own your career. You are going to make yourself successful or not. You're going to make very uncomfortable decisions about, I think I need to leave here. And how do I prepare? Don't ever knee jerk and say, I quit. It is clearly easier to get a job when you have a job. And we can go into that later, why that is, but it's, it's pretty obvious. But know when you're getting stale. Know when you've stopped giving your best. Know when you're not bringing energy into a room and into a project and to a customer's site. And when that happens, you start looking for something else. Conversely, know when a company is acting fidgety. Lots of closed door meetings by management. Lots of strangers touring the business. Lots of phone calls coming in from India or China. <laughs> All of us are competitors. This key competitor seems to be a nice guy and we seem to talk about how sharp they are and mergers, sales, outsourcing, that's all those indications. And when you see that and you hear about that, don't wait and be the last one to turn the lights out. If you're in a department of 30 people doing the same thing and that department function is going to be outsourced to Tennessee or China or closed or lost in the merger, don't let yourself be one of 30 people with the exact same skills, with the exact same background, with the exact same education, looking for a job in San Diego at the exact same time. You be the first one out there. And if you find a great job, go with it. If you were misreading the smoke signals, you moved on to a great job. If you read them correctly, the other 29 are going to be going, why didn't I do that? You didn't do it because you were asleep at the wheel and your career manager let you down. So stay on your toes. Right? If you don't wake up in the morning excited to go to work, then call that career manager right away. Because that is very, very important. When you came in, you and I were talking about that. Later today, you will be helping people with an elevator speech. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, the most painful thing known to me. So what are the key components of an elevator speech? Well, elevator speeches, I, you know, got their name because elevator doors open. I'm standing there, Phil Blair, you hire a lot of people. Somebody that wants a job walks on and they go, I go, hi, how are you? Let's say we know each other superficially. You know, our kids are on the same soccer team. I can't tell you how many often people, <laughs> kids are on the same soccer team. Um, I say, well, J Vicki, how are you doing? You say, oh, fine, it's great, nice to see you, Phil, how are the kids, you know, blah, blah. Elevator opens and I walk out. Vicki goes, darn, I'm in a job search. He hires people, why didn't I talk to him? Because you weren't prepared, right? You let me get off. And I'm walking off the elevator going, Whew, I know she's looking for a job and I got out of it. <laughs> I'll deny I ever said that so these three cameras don't make a lie out of me, right? But really, because we get approached a lot. But there's a very, very professional way to approach us, all HR people. And that's your 30 second elevator speech. So number one, don't be afraid to say you're in a job search. It is not embarrassing, it is not humiliating, it is not degrading. We are all going to be there sometime, by choice or not. So in that scenario, what Vicki could have done is said, things are going really well, Phil, but I just want to keep you updated. I'm in the middle of a job search. And hopefully I say, well, what kind of work are you looking for? And instead of saying, I don't know, <laughs> the 30 second elevator 
speech kicks in. And then I'm really excited about international marketing in the teleconferencing or telecommunications business. And I'd love a job in the marketing area, especially in the international um, Latin America, South America market at companies like Qualcomm, Nokia, or Verizon, if you know anybody. In fact, Phil, here's my card. Could I contact you and maybe do, talk to you for a few minutes about where your company's going? Well, sure, but I'd be glad to. Nice to see you again and walk out. Now, which was the better interaction for somebody in the middle of a job search? Right? There was nothing offensive to me. She was bright, she was articulate. There were a lot of pieces in that. First of all, she said, I'm in a job search. She didn't say, I just got fired, right? In a job search means I'm working. I could be working, I could not be working. It's one of those words that says something but doesn't say anything, right? I'm in a job search. I know she wants to work in Latin America or South America. I know she wants to work international. She could have sort of blended in there, and I'm bilingual if we'd gotten a chance, if, the, if it had been higher on the floor level. <laughs> you know, I figure 30 seconds about a three floor elevator ride. And she gave me examples of companies such as, so as I walk out, I'm going, geez, Qualcomm's my biggest account. Let me think if we need any people, either temp or perm, in their South American operation at Qualcomm. So when Vicky calls me that afternoon to meet, I go, funny, Vicky, I checked in. We've got two openings at Qualcomm and one at Nokia for people that speak Spanish and want to develop a new product in telecommunications in the Latin market. Bingo. I just filled an order, hopefully. She just got the job of her dreams. Now, wait a minute. I know I'm on a roll here, but I have an interview. Don't ask too much. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't interviewed yet, so what should I bring to the interview? What, what, you know, what, what will impress an interviewer? Well, the first thing you're going to use is your resume and your cover letter. And yes, you need both. And absolutely customize your resume for every single job that you really care about. I do a segment on KSA and a call in lady few months ago said, I've submitted my resume, and the tone was just like this. I've submitted my resume to 2,000 companies, and nobody even gets back to me, and I'm really unhappy, and I even applied to Manpower, and they didn't get back to me, and why not? I want to go, well, first let's start with your attitude. <laughs> Would anybody call you back? Right? She had been submitting the same exact resume for 2,000 jobs. Do you think we can't tell this is a marketing job or a call center job, and you're sending me an accounting resume. Or you're sending me such a generalist, I don't know what you do. As easy it is for her to submit 2,000 resumes, guess what's just as easy for me to do? Delete. Now, before Claudia gets upset, delete means put it into a file online somewhere else, not like delete in the trash. I know that. So, the resume has to be spot on to what I'm looking for, right? You highlight in that resume all the skills that are in that job description, and the parts of your past that are, aren't relevant, you just sort of bury in there. Don't make me dig in this example we talked about with Vicki that she's bilingual. Don't make me dig that she's worked at two telecommunications companies before and was in the marketing area. Right? Putting an objective on a resume is subjective. Some people like it and, and some don't. As a recruiter, and I've got the job description in front of me, what the, the key, and there's the you know, five word keyword search, we can go into that. But I know what I'm looking for, what the buzz phrases I'm looking for in a resume, okay? Hit me over the head with them. Don't make me hunt, because I'm not going to. The typical job on Monster averages 250 responses. That's a lot of resumes for me to go through, right? So I see the job description for this job if I were for example, this one we're talking about for Qualcomm, 
I would want somebody who's had telecommunications experience, a degree in, in technology, telecommunication, marketing, whatever my specialty was. I would want somebody that speaks Spanish and had some experience working in South America. I don't want to send by with this. Do I have to get a passport to go to Brazil? Okay, you ain't for me, right? You, I, I can't start at base zero. I want to know you did an internship in Chile and you did an internship in Colombia. You're so focused on wanting to work in the Latin America market. So I'm a believer in the objective on your resume to say, looking for a job with a Fortune 500 telecommunications company where I can use my bilingual Spanish to grow a new and exciting market in the telecommunications environment in the Latin and South American market. Well, I read that and go, son of a God, that's what I'm looking for. Am I going to read on in that resume or not? I clearly am. So when you have a job description, now, you didn't say, I'm looking for a job at Qualcomm, to work in Qualcomm Center. I mean, like, don't be too obvious about this. But as a recruiter, I'm going to look at that and go, he or she, if we're still on Vicky, has read the job description and is interested in that specific job. And in the cover letter, Vicky has said, I'm applying for job 6093 for the senior marketing specialist to develop the widget market in Latin America. Because too often, I get resumes, and I go, now, what job is she applying for? Is it the this one, or the this one, or the this one, or the this Because I've got 20 in front of me. Well, I've now given you my five seconds, and I move on. Five seconds is not long. The typical recruiter looks at a resume for six seconds and then decides to read on and invest in that resume or thank you but no thank you. Don't ever make us dig. In the cover letter, there's three paragraphs. First one is telling me you're excited to apply for the so-and-so job. So I know exactly which one you're applying for. Second paragraph is an example of your writing ability telling me from kind of 35,000 feet why you're qualified for this job. Third paragraph is I'm excited to contact you. Would Tuesday at 10 o'clock be OK if I called you? I have submitted my resume through the portal per Qualcomm's request. I look forward to meeting with you and explaining in more detail my qualifications for this job. Now, that cover letter, I'm looking at your, your writing skills. I'm looking at punctuation. I'm looking at, at um, mistakes you've made, typos. I'm looking at formatting. And the same in the resume. It's got to be a hard to fill position before I will let a resume with a typo go forward. It's got to be some eccentric engineer that is fabulous at what they do but doesn't know how to spell, right? And we all have those. Because if this is the quality of your work you're presenting to me. And if you let it get through with a typo or poorly worded, then that's an example of the kind of work you're going to do for me when I hire you. And I'm not going to proofread when you send a proposal to one of my clients and see if you have typos in it. So keep that in mind. There are little things like that. They say, well, what, what's the big deal? Spill check did something and I didn't catch it. Well, it's a big deal, because I've got 250 resumes to go through. I've got to get that down to five. And so I start looking at what I call nitpicking reasons to disregard resumes. So keep that in mind. This is your sales brochure. If you were selling your product to a brand new customer, would you say, oh, it's got three typos in it, but that's OK. Nobody will notice. People notice. So that's important.
You've been sort of talking about the packaging, the resume, the cover letter. Now you actually have an appointment and you are talking to someone who has hiring authority. And maybe it's just an informational interview or it's a serious interview. Are there mistakes people make, don't realize what they're doing? There are, and let's go, let's go way back to the beginning. <clears throat> You work hard to get that appointment for an interview, right? And all the things we've been talking about. But you get that appointment. And when you are meeting with me, I purposely go out to the reception area and greet my guests. When you think, well, that's a nice thing to do, instead of having my secretary walk them back. It's part of the interview. And let's start with women, because Men don't have as many distractions. Often, way too often, women come in with a trunk called a purse with them and a notebook to take notes and their cell phone and maybe a pen in their hand. And they're sitting in the lobby. And our offices have a gorgeous view, so people sort of get mesmerized by it. So, they're not expecting me. They're expecting my reception or secretary to say, Mr. Blair, see you now. So I walk up and I say, Billy, hi, I'm Phil Blair. Well, let's get back to the Billy. Should not be a Billy. Bill, I'm Phil Blair. Nice to, whoosh, they jump up. We offer coffee, water, so, you know, we're like hospitality. Water spills, purse goes up, phone drops, notebook, and they're like, oh. Well, that was my first impression. As human beings, we give each other five seconds for first impressions. We then give ourselves 10 to 15 seconds next to go, I was spot on, or no, it was a little hard or, or easy. But after about 20 seconds, I've got pretty much in my mind whether this is a potential applicant for the job I want them for or not. So your job is to convince me I'm right or convince me I'm wrong. But why have to convince me I was wrong by you don't need your purse. I'm not going to ask you to fix your makeup in the middle of the interview, right? Leave it in the car. You're probably not going to make phone calls during the interview. I'm just thinking maybe. Don't bring your phone. Don't sit there and panic and go, did I turn my phone off or not? What if it rings? Oh my God. And that, what did you say, Mr. Blair? Right? You don't need that. If anybody wears those silly, stupid things in your ears, don't walk into an interview with them. And, and an aside, in fact, John Trier, who you know, gave me this example. Yes. He was interviewing. You, you're going to meet John later today. When I was doing the book, I, I talked to a lot of HR friends about weird interviews. Yeah, don't tell them where you heard about this and just. You know, an engineer came in with a thing in his ear. And John thought, okay, well maybe, you know, you get used to wearing it, you didn't realize it was there, he forgot, should I say something or not? You know, well, let it go, right? Well into the interview, the applicant goes, well, that, can I call you back? This isn't a good time. He had taken a phone call in the middle of the interview. Was, you know, I like asked John three times, are you, are you punking me here? What, that didn't, he forgot the thing was in there. He didn't turn it off. And somebody called, hey, John, how you doing? Bah, bah, bah. And instead of just ignoring it, he knee jerked and went, I'll have to call you back. I can't talk now. Now, how focused are you on getting this job if you're taking phone calls in the middle of the interview? So don't ever let that happen. You asked to meet with me, right? So it is your date. And I use the example of he or she, whoever asks the other one out on a date, they're the host or hostess. They put the other one at ease. They, right? Somebody's got to do that or you sit there and stare at each other. I tell people, I want you to be the host. I want you to start the conversation. As we're walking back to my office, I want you to say, 
Mr. Blair, I'm very excited to meet you. Thank you very much for meeting with me. I am so excited about this position. I've got so many questions for you about it. It's such a fascinating company, and I love this new project. Know that most interviewers, unless they're professionals, are as nervous or more nervous than you are. And you've practiced to hide it. And the reason the interviewers, who are the department manager or the owner of the company or the regional manager or whatever they are, is HR has scared them half to death about don't ask anything about age, don't ask anything about family, don't ask anything about where they live, don't ask if they have children, don't ask if they have, they're like sitting here, what a, so what's the question they always ask? Tell me about yourself. <laughs> right? Have you all gotten that? How many of you started, well, I was born in Great Bend, Kansas, <laughs> and I have one older brother, and my mother makes the best chocolate coke. She was known for her chocolate. I'm like going, what? <laughs> Who cares about your brother in Great Bend, Kansas? Every question I ask in an interview, you hear, why should I hire you. And I'm going to come around with that question 20 different directions, but your answer is why I am the number one candidate for this job. So when I say tell me about yourself, you here, tell me why should I hire you. I don't care where you're born, I don't care about cookies, I care why I should hire you. Sell, sell, sell. Convince me you're the right person for this job. If you sit there nervously and sit down like this, ready for the Spanish Inquisition, what are you going to ask me? Oh my God, I hope it's not one of those hard questions. Like, what have you, tell me some of the time you failed and how you dealt with it. You know, the whole list of questions we all have. I'm going to go, Jesus, chill, buddy. This is a conversation. I ask questions. You ask questions. I want to get to know you. I know you on paper. I want to get to know you as a person. You're having a wonderful conversation where one wants to, wants to get to know you, and you are reinforcing why you're the right person for this job. And that's an interview. And then there's polite persistence to follow up, which if we have time, we can go into. We've been talking about a new place, a new job, but often these same things come into play because we want to move up in the organization we're in. And so is there anything different about your strategy when it's inside your own company? No, it's the same process. I mean, you're, you're looking for a new job. It just happens to be within the company. Now, obviously, the expectations of knowing about the new department are, are much higher, right? Let's get back to career manager. Remember who that is, right? Rarely, if you, want, if you love the company you're in and you love the product and you love the direction and you love the management and you want to grow in that company, you're going to hit ceilings. I'm at the top of accounting or I'm at the top of marketing. Where do I go? The only place for me to grow is to leave the company. If you look at a CEO's bio, You'll see they worked in finance for two or three years. Then they worked in marketing for three or four years. Then they worked abroad in the international division for five years. Then they worked in sales for three years. Then they were building their competencies and building their resumes. So when the CEO job came open, This Blair guy had sales experience with us, marketing experience with international experience with finance experience. He's got it all. And the other three are spent their whole career in accounting, or spent their whole career in marketing, or their whole career in finance. Or have lived abroad in our international division for 25 years. We never see him or her and they know nothing about headquarters and all the other divisions that make up the success of this company. So when you're managing your career, don't get pigeonholed in one spot. If you want to grow, you're going to need an MBA. Now, depending on your field, it might be a master's, you know, if it's a specific field. But typically, if there's business involved, I'm going to want an MBA in there. 
gosh, I got, a, I got my BA or BS. I thought that was all I needed. Well, yeah, 10 years ago, maybe that was all you needed, but we're not living 10 years ago. I'm going to say, what are you doing to improve yourself? What are, you've been doing this same job for five years and you're stale. Have you got any new certificates? Did you go back to school and get any night school extension? I mean, it's a perfect example at UCSD extension to keep taking classes. That impresses me. Because before you ask for a move to the finance department, you told me about the three finance classes you've been taking over the last year and how fascinating it was. And you've related your marketing department experience with what you learned in the finance classes to show me you've got some great energy to bring to my finance department. Don't wait for them to come to you and say, I'm a rising star in this company. Everybody says so, except nobody knows it. Toot your own horn. Get to know your boss's boss. Get to know your boss's boss's boss. Go up as high up as you possibly can. You pass somebody in senior management on the way, and you stop and introduce yourself and say, I'm Phil Blair. I just read the report on the new product that you just introduced in Europe. I think it is fascinating. Congratulations on a wonderful rollout of that project. What department do you work in? I work in the marketing department, and we put the, we were just a small piece of your success, but we put the park and the brochures together and the say, well, you guys did a great job. Why don't you give me your card? Right? Who's going to be offended by a congratulations? All I want you got a buddy. Next time you're passing the hall, hi Joe, how are you doing? Product still going great, I see. You got a new mentor, you got a buddy. Get a mentor within the company. Somebody that you can trust to go to and say, I think it's time for me to move on. I think I've got this down, and I've got this down, and, and the new supervisor's good, but I'm not learning anything from him. I want to move on. Where do you think I should, where, how do I build my resume in this company? Or is it time for me to move out of this company? And that is a very realistic choice. If they're pigeonholing me and they see me as in the accounting and stay in the accounting, you're doing a great job and we don't want you to move, I don't care that you're bored, mm, maybe that's not the company I want to spend the next 25 years with. So you move out of that company, you take your experiences, and while you have a job, you interview. I did some career coaching for a lady today that they gave her a two-year notice. <laughs> she's ending May of 17, and she's paid in full and encouraged to go look for another job. And if you've, I mean, this was like, I said, I'm putting this in my next book. I mean, and they said, if you find another job, we'll write you a check for the May to 17. <laughs> okay, that doesn't happen very often. But it was just this, that, right before I came here, I was like, still, did I hear that right? Anyway, so manage your career and move around where you need to. Build your career. If your company's getting stale, move. Your coworkers are stale, move to another department, to another company. Companies as huge as Qualcomm have an internal outplacement division. They call it career exploration. And it is for people to very confidentially go to this department and say, I want to grow within Qualcomm. I'm getting stale where I am, and my supervisor isn't encouraging me to learn new things. They're not letting me go to association meetings. But I want to grow in this company. Because what Qualcomm is saying is, I don't want our good people to ever quit and leave us. And us go, we could have used you over here in this new department that you don't even know about yet. So internally, they want to grow their people and move them around and develop skill sets and share best practices. It's to their advantage. That's the sort of company you want to work with. But if you need to leave a company, leave. You'll be surprised how often, two or three jobs later, you're back at the original company as a senior manager because you built such a skill set that they want you back and they know you and you still know people there. 
So you're on a topic now that comes up so often. How many moves can you make before you look like you're a job hopper that you move too often? I think it should average three years. Certain industries, two. Certainly no less than that, because that is a job hopper. Um, you know, we're all temps, but there are certain skill sets that you come in and it takes two years to do it. Yes. You know, integrate a new software or we're trading our complete computer system. And once it's done, I know there's nothing for me to do here and you know you don't need my skill sets anymore. Okay. So it's time to move on. But don't be a job hopper or be able to explain why it appears you were a job hopper. I had someone a few weeks ago that the last three companies had been bought and merged. It, was no, it wasn't reflecting on them. Sure. And once you understood, oh, yeah, Care Fusion was bought by Becton, so-and-so was bought by, yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah that, that does happen and good people do have to, we got two accounting departments, somebody's got to give, and in our case, we were the bot, not the buyer. And the bot tends to be released from their jobs. We collected some questions from the audience. Oh, good. I think there are probably more, but one of them was, what are some of the job skills in most demand today? Technology, technology, technology. If, if that is your strength, play on it. Engineers, programmers, high skill, hit the ground running. But I tell you, you could talk all day and educate all day long, and I would never be an engineer. It just is not in my DNA. So besides that, think about attitude, think about energy, think about enthusiasm, and having done your homework. We are all salespeople. Now, number one, we're selling ourselves in an interview. But number two, any company wants every employee to be a salesperson for their product or for their service. And if you show me this great attitude, I'm gonna tell you at Manpower our theme is we hire for attitude, we teach skills. Videotape your interview, videotape your 30 second elevator speech and look at that and go, would I hire that person? And if the answer is Ugh, Practice, practice, practice. We all want exciting, energized, well-rounded people to join our company, and we'll teach them the skills that are specific to our company. You're going to meet my customers, and I want you to make me proud that you represent my company. How you present yourself in the interview is very important. For those of you who are students at my class, <clears throat> I make the students dress at minimum business casual. Probably half the guys have suits and ties on for class. Now, they're changing in the bathroom <laughs> in the College of Business. I don't care. When they're sitting in front of my CEO guests, who may be in cutoffs and flip-flops, they are impressive looking. Likewise with women. It's a sign of respect in any interview, know what the company dress code is, what their corporate culture is, and go up one step. If you're interviewing at a surfing magazine and you know everybody wears t-shirts, cutoffs, and flip-flops because they surf at noon, that's fine. But show up in slacks and a shirt as a sign of respect. Don't show up in a three-piece suit with a white shirt and a red tie. They're gonna, you don't fit in here, and you obviously didn't your, do your homework about what our corporate culture is. And I doubt if you showed up in a suit, you'd get out of the lobby. You certainly wouldn't get an interview. Watch those things. Ladies, not too much jewelry. Guys, not flashy ties. I don't wanna remember you as the guy with that horrendously ugly brown tie. I can't remember his name, I can't remember what he did. It was just the guy with the ugly tie. 
right? Don't be that. Don't be that. Are you ready for more questions ready. from Shoot. the audience? Most employers won't be too excited to lose a valued employee. If you let your employer know you're looking for something else, what is to stop them from letting you go? Well, there's a very tough decision that only you can make. You need to have conversations with your supervisor and maybe go over their head. Clearly talk to HR, that's in the cone of silence, and say, I'm not growing under John Smith's managerial style, and I really like this company. What can we do to move me to a different department, a different supervisor, a different division? What can we do within the company? I really would like to stay here. And once you feel like you've tried that and hit dead ends, then you start searching confidentially. And I'm a big believer in being very fair to your current employer. You don't call in sick and get paid to go on interviews. You don't sneak out at 2 o'clock because you're interviewing. Because I'm sitting here, and if you say something like, yeah, I called in sick so that I could have this interview today. Really? So that's your attitude toward your employer. And if you ever call in sick, I'm going to think you went to the beach or you're interviewing? Wrong. You interview at night. You interview at Starbucks. You interview at lunch. It's a sign of respect to your current employee. Or you take a vacation day or a PTO day. That's fine too. If you do that, then you inform me I took a PTO day, I took a vacation day because I'm really excited about this, this interview. That says you didn't cheat on the other thing. The other thing while we're on this is why are you leaving? I don't like my boss. He is such a pain in the neck and the company is just going nowhere. And I, I don't know why anybody would work there. It's like the worst place to work in the world. Well, I wonder if in six months or a year, you're going to be saying to the public or to a com customer of mine, oh, that's a terrible place to work. I don't like my boss. He's micromanaging and it's da 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 da. You don't say anything negative about your previous company or your previous boss because I'm going to assume you're going to say it about me soon. So keep that in mind. A shift in subjects. How do you transition from one field to another when you've been in your current field for 20 plus years? Homework, homework, homework. Both taking classes, job shadowing. If you're in the finance department and you've helped worked on a, on a proposal for a company, say, can I go along in the presentation? I just like to see how it works. Maybe I can add value, because this chart is very complicated about how we're financing and you know, the breakdown of our progress. And maybe I can be helpful and explain it. And you just keep learning new things. Management loves that. They love, empl love employees that say, I want to learn more. Can I learn more from you? Can I job shadow with you? Can we have lunch and tell me how, what your thought process was? I was a little piece of that bid, but tell me what the big picture was. How did you come up with that idea? Well, people are very proud of the work they've done, and they'd be happy to talk to you. In fact, what you might say is, I've got three coworkers with that would love to hear this too. Can we all just sit out and grab a table in the cafeteria and talk? You'll get lots of points. Nobody's going to discover you sitting at your desk with your head down doing your work. Work the company. Get to be known. Volunteer to do the company picnic. Volunteer to do the United Way campaign. Volunteer so you get up in front of groups of employees and management sees you in action. The company newsletter is talking about what a great United Way campaign that Phil Blair managed for us. Thank you, Phil, for doing a great job. We really appreciate all the stuff you're doing for our company. Ching. 
Well, I'm going to use that somewhere in my future. But you've got to do that. Is it extra work? Yes. Is it awkward? Is it uncomfortable? Is it nerve wracking? Yes. Getting ahead in this world is awkward, is nerve wracking, and it's uncomfortable. But once you master that next step, you look back and go, thank heavens I didn't stay in that job and rot in the accounting department. Sorry to pick on the accounting department, but it's my least favorite department <laughs> in my company. I have no idea what they do in that department, but I just know it's not mine. No, it's not for me. But it's important stuff. Oh, it's very important. Yes. Love you accounting people. Just, just realize I kept using them as the negative example. <laughs> the, this question relates to something you talked about earlier. How do I decide whether to pursue a master's or a certificate? Well, typically a certificate's a three-month investment of, you know, one night a week. A master's is two years of giving up weekends and giving up a day a week and a weekend, you know, even an executive MBA is it's a lot of work. But I tell you, the people I talk to that are going through it say it was so interesting. I learned so much and I'm so happy I did it. And yeah, I complained about the long hours and, and the you know, missing a soccer game because I had a test to study for. But when I look back, it was fascinating. And I learned so much and met such interesting people that I am thrilled to have that degree. Let me, that reminds me of something, Vicki. If we have any Eagle Scouts in the room or any Girl Scouts, Golden Girls or Golden, whatever the equivalent is a gold, you put that on your resume. I don't care if you're 82 years old and it was 60 years ago. You put your, that on your resume. In the most awkward age we all have, which is, what, 13 to 18, right? You started something difficult and you finished it. In the most awkward years of your life. If you can do that, and only 2% of Boy Scouts accomplish that, huge kudos. That tells me a lot about you as an adult, about what you accomplished when you were a child. So look for those examples when you're interviewing. For example, when I was working on my Eagle Scout, I was so proud because my project was Oh, I didn't realize you were an Eagle Scout. Let's talk about that. Because I was in scouting, and I tried to get my Eagle, and I dropped out. And I've, res and I've always respected people who wrote it through. Ching. Got big points for that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, someone is following up on something you mentioned, which is polite persistence. You've had the interview. You want to follow up. Tips for how to do that successfully. Well, when you're interviewing for a job, it is the number one priority in your life, right? It just might not be the number one priority with the people that you're interviewing with. I've got 10 jobs I'm trying to fill. The one I interviewed you for was just one of them. And it is not as time sensitive as two other ones are. So yeah, you did a really good job, but it's off to the side of the desk. Well, how do I move it to the front of the desk? If we have time, thank you notes are essential. In some industries, you send a very fast email one, but follow up with a written one. You phone, just checking in to make sure to see how the job for the sales uh, manager's coming along. If you need any more information, I can be reached at so and so and so. Okay. So I got the email, ching, I got the handwritten one, impressed. I was very impressed with the phone message you left. Five days later, you found an article in a magazine that we were talking about, and you made a copy and dropped it off. Dear Phil, we were talking about this in the interview and this new concept that is happening in buying trends in Latin America, and I thought you might find it interesting. Hope we get a chance to chat soon. My cell phone is so-and-so, my email is so-and-so. So that's five hits. 
and you just paste more of those. Next, it's an email. I know you're busy. How is pro your project on the sales manager coming along? We're still excited. I'm following Qualcomm and lots of great stuff. Stock's doing great. Love to chat further. Then maybe there's a phone call. Polite persistence. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Not going to be a secret anymore after this is on TV, is it, now that I say that? If somebody wants to meet with me, I never take their first call. I often don't take the second call. By the third time, if they are politely persistent, I will take the call. Because they have invested enough energy in wanting to meet with me that it is now worth me considering. If I, they call and say, oh, I'd like to meet with you. Okay, how about tomorrow at 10 o'clock? It's like, whoa, what? Like that dream is going to come true, right? I want to see polite persistence. You really care and it's important to you to meet with me that you're putting energy into it. And if the tone gets a little, this is the third message I've left, and you haven't called me back yet, yeah, that's going to happen. Don't let it creep into your voice. Don't let your frustration. Don't say things like, we interviewed two months ago, and I still haven't heard back anything from anybody. <laughs> Honey, you ain't going to hear nothing from nobody. Right? In this situation, I've got the gold, I make the rules. I know it's frustrating, it's irritating, but play the game. Thank you for sharing that secret. We now know how to get to Phil. <laughs> call one, call two, three call three. Phone calls, yeah. yes. Thank you for sharing other secrets. Uh, believe it or not, we have come to the end of our time. Will oh. you help me to thank Phil for his wisdom? Thank you. Thank you. Good fun.